Good morning, and thank you everyone for being here for this truly urgent and frankly heartbreaking discussion. We're fortunate to have with us two leaders who've been working to tackle this crisis head on. As you just saw in the video, the number of women dying from pregnancy-related causes has doubled over the last 25 years, making the United States the most dangerous place to give birth in the developed world. Mayor Bowser, Stacy, let's start with this big picture. Why are we moving backward as a nation on this issue? Well, I think it's, it's startling, um, and most people aren't familiar with those numbers. Uh, and I think it took very high-profile women having the courage to come out and talk about their birth experiences that caught a lot of people's attention. Uh, the truth is those numbers have been trending in that way for many years. So uh, what we know uh, is that it's going to take the, the resources, the attention, of all of us in cities uh, and the federal government to make some progress in this effort. And we, for one, uh, in our city, have set the, the goal uh, and are putting all of our resources and intentions behind driving down maternal um, mortality and infant death in our city. Stacy, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think the, the video uh, really pinpointed some really important statistics, and I think you know, this has been an issue in this country for many, many years. Over the past, you know, couple of decades, every wealthy nation in the country, in the world, has seen a reduction in maternal mortality. We've seen an increase. And, and I think part of the issue is that um, we have had a lot of systemic challenges in this country for a long time. We've had racial inequity for a long, long time, going back generations. Um, some of us are just waking up to some of these facts, but some of us have been living this reality for a, for a very long time. Well, what are other countries doing right that we're doing wrong? A woman is more likely to die here than in Canada, in the UK. Right. Well, a lot of countries have universal health care to start. So, let's just start with that. Um, okay. I think when you deny people health care and the ability to pay for it, you're automatically going to leave people behind, and people are not going to have the best outcomes. And that affects even the most vulnerable, including our children and our babies, right? Um, in addition to women. But I think there's some other things. There are other policies that um, create a more supportive environment for women to have babies um, healthier and for them to be healthier. You know, um, ex expanded leave policies, for example. Um, gender pay equity issues are, are more prominent in other countries. Um, in European countries, we've seen a lot of, of, of uh, success on some of these issues. And, but frankly, uh, those countries don't have nearly the diversity that we enjoy here in the United States. And I think the United States has to confront the fact that we have not um, dealt with the issue of race in this country in the way that it needs to be dealt with. We know that the issue of poor health outcomes for moms and babies is not about race, but about racism. Um, and until we address that fact and acknowledge that and openly talk about that, it'll be more difficult for us to address some of the challenges that we face. Well, let's dig a little deeper on the racial disparities, because if you look at national or local statistics, what jumps out is that black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than their white counterparts, that black infant mortality is twice the rate for white babies. So directly, what role does racism play in all of this in society and in the healthcare system? Well, we really wanted to dig deep into this question um, in our city. And a couple of years ago, I launched a national maternal and infant health uh, conference right here in Washington, DC. Uh, we host it during the Black Caucus Conference um, that happens in Washington, DC uh, every single year to bring together federal lawmakers, uh, mayors from across the nation uh, to talk about uh, these issues. Uh, in our city, for example, access to insurance and health care is not the issue. Over 95% of Washingtonians have insurance. Um, so people of all incomes uh, can go to primary care, specialized care, hospital care. And so we wanted to know uh, what it's going to take um, for all of our citizens to be taking advantage of the best health care possible. And when they do, are they heard? Are they listened to? Um, and is everything being done possible to have them have healthy outcomes? So we, part of our strategy uh, is to make sure that we're talking to our residents 
preconception, uh, talking to them about what, do they plan to have babies? Are they connected to a primary care provider? Uh, do they need specialized care? Uh, we're also focused in that campaign, we call it our Well Women campaign, uh, making sure they are having that relationship. Uh, what we find um, is that all of our residents don't uh, feel respected in those interactions, and that's why it's a lot of the work that Stacy is doing around educating providers around the country about the biases that may, they may bring uh, into their care is so important to saying, it's not enough to say, do we have insurance, but do people feel heard and respected when they go to see their doctors? Stacey, you're talking about implicit bias in yeah. the healthcare system? Exactly, I mean, on the maternal, and the mayor's exactly right, I mean, a lot of, a lot of what we're seeing in terms of why we're seeing high rates of um, maternal mortality in this country we have to do a lot with misdiagnoses, delayed diagnoses, about not having um, consistent care for all women, especially women of color. So, and when we look deeper at that, we know, we can see, and there are plenty of uh, studies that show that women, black women especially, often talk about the fact that they do not feel respected and heard by the healthcare system. And it's not just doctors and nurses. It often is the front desk receptionists. When they show up at the clinic, someone doesn't make eye contact with them, doesn't recognize them as, as a whole being in front of them, right? And, and the word of mouth spreads, and then they choose not to go back to, to, to seek care from that, from that clinic or that, uh, that provider. So one of the things that we're doing at the March of Dimes is, in addition to many other things, is uh, launching implicit bias training. Now, the one great thing about this is that some of the federal legislation addressing maternal mortality really does require this, and we do encourage Congress to pass this leg legislation. California um, just recently passed state uh, legislation requiring all healthcare providers uh, to go through implicit bias training. We all have implicit biases, all of us. But to the extent that implicit bias actually hinders or inhibits the ability for that healthcare provider to provide high quality, consistent care to any woman, irrespective of her race, ethnicity, her language, whatever it is, then we have to address that and, and really do some things to, to counter that. In, in terms of national data collection, wouldn't a standardized system across all the states be a good place to start in terms of getting accurate numbers and then being able to evaluate and investigate the cases so we can get to the causes? Well, I know the mayor causes? can talk about this a lot because of the work she's doing. Um, we were really uh, proud to be a part of uh, passing legislation at the end of last year, the Preventing Maternal Deaths Act, which actually supported all states setting up what we call maternal mortality review committee. So part of the issue of this is that we were not even respecting the issue enough to collect data on it, right? We weren't even looking at collecting consistent data across all states at the same time in the same way to provide more transparency to the issue. That legislation now provides for each state to have a maternal mortality review committee um, and so that we can collect better data and design better interventions. We should have been doing this a long time ago, but it's good that we're now getting to it right now. And we launched our committee um, earlier this year, uh, and, and our lo local legislation requires um, that we're collecting all kinds of information related to maternal death, um, including other factors um, that we may find in the investigation of a mom's death that may, led, uh, may have led to her death that had nothing to do with her pregnancy. Um, so all of that information is going to help us <clears throat> build a government that supports women and families. Uh, we have, for example, uh, another commission um, in the district called Thrive by Five, and we have a director. Uh, this came out of our first infant and uh, maternal health summit, um, a director of our Thrive by Five coalition uh, that is really responsible for looking across all of our agencies and identifying, helping me identify budget priorities um, and making sure that we're funding um, the initiatives that our Department of Health um, has deemed effective. Uh, and one of those is making sure that we are funding local organizations. Uh, part of the data suggests to us um, that the closer we can get to the grassroots and supporting women, the more likely they are to trust um, those providers. Um, so if we can get funding out to Mary Center, a well-respected organization in our community, for example, community hope um, in community, so people aren't traveling long distances and they're more likely to know the providers, um, we know know that we can uh, provide more supportive environments for them during their pregnancy. 
Now you're dealing with the maternal mortality rate here that's twice the national average. I know some of your efforts are on the new side, but are you seeing progress and do you feel hopeful? I do feel hopeful, um, and we look at, of course, we looked at the data um, over a 10-year period um, prior to launching our health summit, and we, we were startled by it. For a city uh, that has uh, the only, we're the second most insured jurisdiction in the United States of America, only just following Massachusetts, uh, and that's been the case for more than five years, uh, and actually before the Affordable Care Act. Um, so the amount of investment that that we put uh, into healthy outcomes for DC residents, uh, should, we, should, we know that we should have better numbers. Now there are things that the government can't control. We know that we have uh, our residents who have, carry with them generations of stress, exactly. anxiety, um, and all of those things they take uh, in, uh, into a pregnancy. So putting that to the side, because we can't control for that generational uh, anxiety and stress that women bring into uh, a pregnancy, uh, but all of the things that we can control, we are getting women uh, connected to their primary uh, care providers so that they're well women going into pregnancies, helping connect people to prenatal services, and post-pregnancy is also important. We know that we're watching mothers and infants for that entire first year. Uh, so being able to fund visits uh, into homes um, and follow-ups um, to doctors um, is key uh, to making sure that first year is successful for them. Exactly. I'd just like to remind the audience that we'll be coming for your questions in just a moment so we can have them ready. Stacy, are there any other cities with especially high numbers of mothers and babies yeah. dying? And also, are there any good, uh, good models for other cities to follow? Yeah, well, first, I would say the, uh, one of the best models is right here in, in the District of Columbia. And Mayor Bowser, and I've told her this, and, and I will keep telling her this, that she's, I think, providing some of the best leadership uh, among all mayors um, on this issue. Uh, the summit that she's just had, um, you know, like a 1,000 people came not only building awareness, but getting information out to, to people so that her constituents and the residents of the District of Columbia really are empowered with information. I think one of the big missing pieces in this is that sometimes we can often feel victimized by this, by what we hear on the news and the discussion, but I think it's really important to understand that we all can take ownership of our own health. And that won't solve the issue completely. We do need to deal with the systemic failures that are uh, affecting our health. But I do think it's incumbent upon all of us to understand that there are things that within our power that we can do. And I think what she's doing in her leadership is really providing that. Um, I will also say, too, one of the other things that we're doing in the District of Columbia um, is launching what we call supportive pregnancy care, which is a form of group prenatal care, which has been shown to have the uh, 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 results of, of reducing preterm birth, premature birth, by anywhere from even 30% up to 70% in some cases. Um, and it's especially effective for women of color. This is just, these are just women who come together in a supportive environment, uh, who are pregnant, and who can support each other during their pregnancy. And what we know is that it absolutely helps to reduce the stress and anxiety that often can influence um, and affect and cause even um, poor uh, health outcomes for women as well as for babies. Uh, in DC, there are some great examples of some great work that's being done. Um, we're working across the country, and there are great cities like Boston and Houston and other cities that are really tackling this issue. One of the big examples that we're tracking very uh, carefully is in LA, where there's an AIM initiative that is really looking to reduce racial disparities um, in birth outcomes, uh, really especially looking at the racial disparity among, among babies in the issue of infant mortality. It's a newly launched uh, effort, but what I would say is that, and I think this is the most important thing, is that just like here in DC, there's no one sector, there's no one entity alone that can solve this. What we know about premature birth and maternal mortality is that it has to do not only with what happens in the, cl in the clinician's office, in the doctor's office, but it has very much to do with how women live. You know, access to transportation, access to healthcare, um, housing. housing, and all of, the, all of the kinds of factors that affect a woman's life can both influence her life and the life of her baby. So it requires a very cross -colla uh, and collaborative effort, cross-sector uh, effort, um, to really bring all the right sectors together between employers, uh, local and state government, um, nonprofit organizations, healthcare providers, and a whole, uh, a whole group of, of different entities that can come together and combine strategies so that more success can be made and there can be more 
um, supportive activities uh, to lead to better results. And we know that babies born prematurely suffer. What's behind the rise in the number of preterm births the states is seeing? Well, the, what, what we say at the March of Times is we don't really just have one crisis, we have two, right? We have a maternal health crisis, we have an infant health crisis. And the fact of the matter is, is that we've got to address women's health before women are pregnant. And I think the, what a lot of us have been doing for many years is focusing on the woman while she's pregnant, mm -hmm. but often that's too late to turn the tide in a very substantial way. It's not to say that we don't need to be providing excellent health care to women, that women don't need to be receiving and have access to high quality, affordable prenatal care. But what we are seeing is that a lot of the issues that lead to maternal death and maternal morbidity um, have everything to do with how a woman's uh, health, uh, what it looks like even before she's pregnant. Often the issues that she experiences in terms of her own health impact the baby's health. And so it, it just naturally um, flows that if a woman's health and a mom's health while she's pregnant is declining, that that's going to impact the baby. In fact, what we're seeing is while we're seeing a doubling of maternal uh, mortality rates over the past 25 years, this is now the fourth year of an increase in preterm birth rates. And prematurity and the consequences of prematurity are the leading causes of death for children between the ages of zero and five, which is often very shocking for people. And what we know is that a woman, a black woman, is up to 50% more likely to have a baby prematurely. So just like we have issues on the maternal health side, we have issues on the infant health side. And there are times when we have to think about a woman as a, as a woman, independent of the baby. And there are times we have to think about the two of them together as a unit. Okay. Well, let's talk about access to care for a moment. More than 5 million women across 1,000 counties live in areas that March of Dime calls um, maternity deserts. And even a city as populous as Washington has certain zones that are considered maternity care deserts. Can you explain these and talk about their impact on health? Well, let, let me start by saying uh, we, we're very focused in our city. We are a city, uh, you probably, uh, many people in this room have heard me talk about the fact that we have eight wards in our city. Um, we, are, we have two wards separated from the six wards by a river. Uh, and we're very focused on how to have more access um, for all DC residents. So we don't want geography uh, to be an issue for them. Uh, and uh, we're focused right now in our city on a whole health care system transformation to get more hospital beds closer to people who need them. But more, even more important than hospital beds is a system of care that supports people so they don't have to be in the hospital. Uh, and we are especially concerned about specialty OBGYN care closer to uh, the people who need it. Uh, so everything that the government can do, not only to invest in a new hospital, um, but to encourage providers to practice um, closer uh, to residents who need it. Uh, and geographies that are separate, separated by a river uh, is part of our focus in, in, with our healthcare transformation effort. Are midwives and doulas good alternatives for people who don't have immediate access to hospitals? I, I think so. I mean, part of this issue of the materni maternal care deserts and the study that we did, we looked at these 35% of all counties in the country uh, lack a hospital that offers obstetric services, uh, lack even one OBGYN, and lack a certified nurse midwife. 35% of all counties, it affects about 5 million women. About 10 million, 10 million women live in uh, limited uh, care uh, deserts. And um, so it affects a lot of women. It affects a lot of babies that are born. Um, about four-fifths of all the counties uh, that are considered maternal care deserts are in rural areas. Um, but about a fifth of them are in urban areas. And um, in Ward 7 and 8, we would consider uh, here in the District of Columbia um, having with a, a, a limited care, a maternal care desert, I would say. Uh, and that's where we would say that absolutely, um, looking at alternative forms, as the mayor mentioned, of care, a system of care is really important. Doulas and midwives, historically and generationally, have always been relied on by women, especially women of color. There was a time in this country where that was the primary way that women gave birth. Uh, gave birth. Uh, we've gotten away from that. We've, we've, we've created a very hospitalized environment, and in many cases that has proven to be very effective. But in many cases, um, it is good to have alternative uh, forms of prenatal care, uh, way, other ways that women feel uh, are more cult cult culturally competent ways of, uh, of having their baby and delivering their baby. And we also believe that those kinds of uh, forms of care need to be covered by Medicaid as well. Medicaid covers 43% of all births in this country. 
Medicaid is a primary payer of pregnancy and childbirth in this country. And, and we've got to make sure that if women want to have access to other forms of care that they feel meets their needs and is more attuned to their needs, we have to make sure that our system of care um, provides uh, for the affordable option for those women as well. All right. Well, let's turn to the audience for a moment and see if there are any questions. Okay, we have one right here. Hi. Good morning. Julia Richmond, Chief Innovation and Technology Officer, City of Boulder. I wonder if um, any work has been done evaluating places where there's higher levels of access to family planning and, and um, reproductive rights and the correlation uh, between maternal health. Another question. Um, I don't know that I have that study offhand. Um, what, what we do know is that access to quality, high quality family planning is extremely important uh, to make sure that a woman is able to manage her own health. And what we also know is uh, um, care conception, um, intraconception intra care between, um, the, between pregnancies is also very important. What we know is that birth spacing and spacing the birth can actually reduce the risk of a preterm birth. Um, after the first birth or a, a, a subsequent birth after one pregnancy. So when we limit those options for women, we know that we are likely to see poor health outcomes for a mom and a baby. So um, we haven't looked at the exact correlation of it, but we know that there absolutely is a connection for sure. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. <clears throat> yes. Hi, Kathy Sheehan. I'm the mayor of the city of Albany. And health services in our uh, community are, are uh, at the county level. And um, I'm interested, you talked about women feeling disrespected when they go to their practitioner, but we have a huge underutilization of the services that are available by healthcare workers who work for the county. Um, and the commissioner of the county health department says that you know, a lot of it is that um, I think there's fear, right? There's fear that um, if you let this person into your house, um, and it's not clean enough, or there is something going on, or historically there's this fear of, of having these services come into the home and into the community. Have you worked on, you know, you talk about implicit biases, but, but breaking that down so that those early services that are available, um, to me it's shameful that they're underutilized. We have empty seats for safe and healthy families, um, and part of it is just this divide between the the nurse practitioners, the, the providers that are going out, and, and the community's trust of those individuals. I, I wouldn't agree with you more. We have some of our services that are underutilized, especially well women vet visits um, to primary care doctors, I would say is the biggest category of underutilization. And then we have some of our services, Mayor, that are overutilized, and some other mayors are gonna know what I mean. Calls to 911. Uh, emergency room visits. Um, and we know for a fact that that uh, type of care won't lead to the types of outcomes we want uh, for women and babies. So uh, our focus has to be how we are connecting uh, and listening to our residents and meeting them uh, exactly where they are. I'm reminded of a trip you asked about cities around the world that we took to Cuba. Cuba has one of the best um, experiences with uh, healthy moms and healthy deliveries in the world. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, the outtakes I have from that, is that doctors are in the communities where people live, literally. Um, and the distance between the doctor and the patient is much smaller. And our country is much bigger. Uh, and so how do we take that literal geographic small space between patient and doctor uh, into uh, a setting, uh, whether it is in the doctor's office or some other way that we bring clinicians into communities. So that distance, that fear, the information asymmetry, if you will, is shortened uh, in interactions with our residents and our health professionals. So I don't know exactly um, all of the ways and all of the things that we have to do to shorten that space, but I know for sure um, that's what it is. Our people are voting with their feet. Instead of going to a provider in their community, um, when it's more convenient, when it's less wait time, all of those things, they're choosing instead to call an ambulance and go sit in an emergency room. So we know that there are things that we have to do to change that experience for our residents. 
Mayor Stacy, I thank you for your expertise on this issue. Thank you all very much, too. Thank you. Thank you.